begin. Hi everyone, welcome to the sustainability and lifestyle webinar. Thank you for attending today. For those of you who will be listening to the recording, um, we've recorded the event for your benefit. Um, okay, so let's get started. Let me share my screen here. I get so nervous, you have no idea. <laughs> Okay, Chanel is going to be helping me um, admitting people into the webinar as well as helping me read questions out of the chat box. I'm going to keep asking you questions because it's 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 um I want your input for the webinar. This is a lot of this stuff you know already, and I'm sure there are probably five interns here that can give this webinar ten times better than what I'm going to do today. So this is just our webinar on refreshing concepts and maybe trying to get some of you a little bit more involved in action. So let's get started and I'll just present this this way. Ah, I'm sharing my screen so you can see how I'm troubleshooting this. Okay. All right, and I just want to make a point that um, this is the slide from our 2020-21 theme for World Migratory Bird Day. Uh, fly, sing, and soar like a bird. Ah, oh, and I, I, I know it better in Spanish, but so this is available for your download if you're interested in looking at that presentation and even offering that presentation. Just let me know. We'll talk a little bit more about this. What we're going to do today is go over oops, go over what is sustainability. And like I said, I can say many things, but please let me know what you think about what is the definition of sustainability according to what you know or what somebody taught you. So we're going to be very active in the chat box today. Because like I said, this is something that we all know. This is something we all know about. And I think if we, do to everybody's knowledge, you learn, I learn. So what is sustainability according to the definition from 1987 when it was coined? If anybody can share that in the chat. Maybe I'll start because it will still, still, I don't know, getting started with this. So it's, it's basically like the statement says here, it's a way of organizing society so that it can exist in the long term. But the most important part of the definition, like I said, that was defined in 1987, was that we needed to take into consideration this generation and the next generation so we can use our resources for our own benefit but we have to take into consideration the future generations and that's why uh, sustainability became so important conserving actually and conserving resources today for future generations well the, the tricky part is that uh, we're allowed to use our resources. We're allowed to use our resources without, without affecting future generations. So that's why it says in the long term. Oops. So when we say we can use our resources in a sustainable way, we mean that we need to meet our basic needs, but we can't compromise the ability of, of future generations and their basic needs. So because we're animals, the first three, food, water, and shelter, we know of the ones, uh, us that like to work with wildlife, just like animals, we need a supply of food, we need a supply of water, and we need protection from climate, and that's our shelter. We have basic needs, right? Uh, other basic needs like clothing and, and of course the intrinsic ones that society has constructed like education and public safety. So for this, uh, for this, because, because we need to meet our basic needs 
And that food one is very important. And we'll get into that, um, how agriculture has been, has been neglected in certain countries and embraced by others the water supply, how some people are striving and just they, if they could scream to the world, they're concerned about the water supply, they would, they try, they do try. And it's just that we, we feel conservationists feel people are not listening, but they are, they are. And recent events have augmented our voices in, in certain areas. And not everybody has shelter, not everybody has clean water, not everybody has food. So what we're trying to do here is sustainable for who, right? We're trying to define. So for us today, what we're gonna do is go over uh, certain concepts. Like I said, there are, the, the definition of sustainability was only coined uh, recently in the 80s, late 80s, recent 90s. And that was yesterday, right? In science, that was, that was just a minute ago. So the three Ps are, are, are the people, planet, and, and profit. There is, because of our system, there is no way to ignore either the people or the planet. But, you know, sometimes I cringe at, at, at that that economy P because, well, right now our system can't allow for it not to be in there. But we, to, to be sustainable, we have to be in the middle of all three. We have to take into consideration basic needs of the people, but also the basic needs of the planet and find a way for our system, like it or not, to endure in that because all of us right now are wearing clothes and that took into account a certain impact to the environment. Uh, we'll go into the National, the National Park Service and how they have to maintain parks. So they have to allow for somebody to pay an entrance fee. And that's part of the economy that maintains the park. So like I said, there's no way that with our system, we can't take into account the profit. And, and we have to, we have to, in, in order for us to be able to deal with a problem, we have to take into account all the factors. And these are the most important factors that we know of for a sustainable lifestyle. So the United Nations, and I, I, I really like um, talking about the UN because they, they take all the experts in a certain field and put them in a room together. Not that that's very, very, um, a very lineal way to put it, but no, they, they bring together scientists uh, for, for, for their expertise. And there's, are, there are scientists in sustainability and they came up with 17 sustainable goals. And each one of these goals will hit you differently. For example, right now in Puerto Rico, the power company that has been the power company for the past 30 years, 40 years, went broke. And so it is now privatized. And the first thing that happened the first week of the new company were blackouts. So remember that last Friday when, when I was in the check-in call with, with um, some of you, I said, I had to look for Wi-Fi because there's no Wi-Fi, there's a blackout. And it's been a crisis for all of us who are teleworking. So this, so this one right now is, is one that I am concerned about, affordable and clean energy. And that's goal number seven. And that's because last week this hit me. But some of you might say, well, you know, I'm uh, in my family, there was a lot of COVID because whatever reason. So right now the goal is good health and well-being in our family, in our county. Um, so this one is, is, is the one that I'm going to be looking at to, to work on. But like I said, they worked on 17 goals. So you can look at the, these goals and say, I want to work with, with number one, I want to work with number 15, life on land, which is what, what we do at Environment for the Americas. But we can't 
work on 15 and not work on number seven. We can't work on number 15 and not work on number 13, right? They're all in a way um, uh, sustainable goals that are entangled in one way or another, but we just emphasize on how we're gonna do our, our work. And today, my work is gonna take me to, to, to talk to you about, have a conversation hopefully about how to work on a lot of these goals with simple actions and how we do it at Environment for the Americas very proudly. So the first thing that we take into consideration is our impact because we like nature. So we say, let's, let's go out, but out to the beach. Uh, yeah, yeah, that this is what's happening. This, this, it's overpopulated, right? It's, we are, the carrying capacity on our uh, natural resources in some places is, is really, is really dwindling. What about, Anybody recognize that area? Just in case. That's Coachella. I haven't been there. I didn't take that photo from the internet, but it's very popular. And anybody recognize this photo? So this is from an article, uh, the New York Times, and the article was named Crisis in Our, in our National Parks because one of our impacts in the national parks is, and this has been recognized over and over, the amount of people that visit the parks annually is actually not beneficial to some of the parks. When you say 3 million people go through the Rockies in one year, Yellowstone is more than that. I know uh, the, the number on the Rockies because I go there, I'm a user of the Rocky Mountains and the education and outreach LHIP intern that year said that that's, that's a, high, a high use in this park and we have to do something about that too. So there's interns out there that their, own, their only job is to measure impact of, of high use in the parks and how to mitigate that. So something that our 2020 has, has led to in lessons is how to measure, how to take into account capacity because of social distancing. Now that is something that will help our, our parks and the natural resources in them. I don't know if anybody is working here with um, counting users. I know in 2019 in Carlsbad Caverns, the intern there took it upon herself to measure the amount of CO2. She found an equipment to do so. So she did it, she was measuring CO2, which is what we emit when we, when we uh, breathe in the cavern. So she was measuring CO2 to see how many people were there in, the, in, in a given moment. And that made such an impact on, on the strategies they were taken into consideration for use in Carlsbad Caverns. That's very important work. Uh, like I said, <laughs> We're measuring our impact, and that is the um, that is known as the um, Anthropocene <laughs> era. And and when I say it started a minute ago, it's because it was the other day in in terms of how long the Earth has been alive, right? Billions of years. So when you take a holistic view of how it happened, what has happened and how long it took to happen. And here we come and, and we see how our diversity is, is lower than ever. And we say, this is, this is a cycle. Um, extinction is supposed to happen. Yeah, it's supposed to happen. Look at that uh, time frame when it's supposed to happen. Extensions happen way over time. And we're making it faster for some of the species, for many, many of the species. And we are unfortunately a dominant life form that is causing all the others to diminish in populations. And we are consuming everything without, remember when, when in the first or second slide I said, uh, sustainability is for future generations. We don't take into account 
the generations of other species that we're affecting. So we are in, in Anthropocene and what we can do to, to demand, to arreglar eso. <laughs> what we can do to fix it is take into account, oh, take into account what we can do. So one, one of those, one of those days when, when we do not bird camp, well, an activity, World Migratory Bird Day, we ask people, what does a sustainable lifestyle mean to you? And you could just write in the chat box what it means to you to, to live sustainably. Not what you do, not what you do. I don't, if you say, well, I, I use, uh, a reusable water bottle. That's what you do, those are actions, but how do you live sustainably? It's a lifestyle. Do you live sustainably? Do you think you live sustainably? Do you know you're not living sustainably and I prefer not to stay in the chat box? <laughs> sustainability is holistic you know that's good okay so let me let me put up in the screen what what i have so one person said and being green oh they they took the question sustainable lifestyle and turned it into being green that was very interesting being green means recycling and properly disposing of trash being green means making the world a more livable place for her nieces, and nephews, and showing a more generalized way of thinking about sustainability. And to protect where you come from, the earth. Like I said, uh, let me see what you guys wrote. Taking into account how your actions and how they affect the community and environment. I think we could all live more sustainably, Devante, yeah. Me too. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm, I'm still struggling, but I'll give examples on 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 how I learned and and who gave me an example on how to do it. So, like I said, um, Environment for the Americas is is working towards certain goals about uh, sustainable lifestyle, about how you go green, and 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 how you educate people on how to do these things. And one way that we do this is, is through World Migratory Bird Day, which is an event, well, events going on in the Western hemisphere, because our mission is to, through these events in the Western hemisphere and across the globe, connect people with birds, connect people in, in cultures and con conservation actions. So. Like I said, I'm very proud of the work we do because we've been doing it for so for about 12 years now. And there are coordinators of the World Migratory Bird Day officially. We, I mean, this started way back in when Environment for the Americas wasn't even an organization. Susan Bonfield was working with Fish and Wildlife Service and these people were producing educational materials and sending it out to countries and wildlife refuges. And, and, and Susan was, was telling me, who, you know, who do you know that we can send materials to besides these refugees? And I was going, I don't know, educators in the Caribbean. <laughs> this was way back in 2005. We were just brainstorming how we can do this in a network. And fast forward to 2007, EFTA is born. And fast forward to 2005. I think it was uh, 18, Miguel Mata comes on the team and says, we got to take this to the next level. I mean, we need coordinators in every major region like we have in the Caribbean. I was in the Caribbean. And then last year, Laura Babula came in to be the coordinator for the Caribbean. We have Leticia in Central Amer America. Mexico has their own coordinator because you know, it's huge. So and a lot of people are doing World Migratory Bird Day. And of course, we have a new program manager, Daniela Garcia, who is responsible for coordinating North America World Migratory Bird Day with the help of you know, the whole team, the whole team in Boulder office and, 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 and us. So we all 
help out, but this is the official team of WMBD coordinators in the Americas. Like I said, we're working hard to connect cultures, connect people in the conservation of birds. And while we're doing this, we're working towards a sustainable goal and we are doing it through theme and call to action. Every day is bird day, but it's officially in the second Saturday of May and the second Saturday of October. And what we do is, oops, I, I, I forgot to, to put 2021 in there. What we do is we encourage you to, as an intern, to celebrate an, an event at your park. And what you can do is just, you know, you can do many things, many things, get creative because, oops, because we need the information to get out there. And the information includes, like I said, a conservation theme and simple actions that we all can do as a community. And let me make a pause here, a parenthesis. And this is the hard part, right? This is where we go, wait, so you're telling me that I have to do this while corporations out there, you know, don't seem to give anything back to the communities and don't even care how they're affecting the environment. And this is where we say, we're responsible of ourselves. We need to be an example. We need to uh, voice our concerns. And the, we have a platform, we have an opportunity as one person to make a difference. So yes, I did not include anything about corporations here, large corporations, what they should do, because I will use another platform for that. Public policy, laws, bigger organizations like National Wildlife Federation that goes to DC and lobbies. Yes, those need to be addressed. But here we're concerned of, of what we can do as, as an intern at the park, okay? We're concerned here with what our Small actions can make big impacts. And I don't want to sound cliche. I hate cliches, but sometimes <laughs> some of these really do resonate with people. I love this idea. I'm not creative at all. So when somebody does something like this, I love it. I just absolutely love it. So this was done uh, in October, 2020 in the UK. Like I said, we have conservation themes and in 2019 the conservation theme was be the solution to plastic pollution and this has been one of the biggest ones one of the most powerful themes because everybody took into heart what we were saying about plastic and it wasn't just environment for the americas that year it turns out a lot of people were talking about plastic pollution so we augmented the conservation message so much that we had the most events in, in recent years to do something about plastic pollution. And like I said, because we're celebrating World Migratory Bird Day, our main focus is a call to action for migratory bird protection. This doesn't mean that when we do a beach cleanup, we're not protecting resident birds or endemic birds. We're protecting habitat for birds, other animals, and ourselves. We know this. We just put a label on it because this is our flag, right? This birds are our flags to do good conservation actions. Four simple ways to host a World Migratory Bird Day. Oh, in a park. So the first one that we like to promote is hosting a cleanup just because plastic is one of our biggest problems. So it doesn't matter that 2019 is over and now we have another conservation theme, 2021 come. No, 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 it's still a problem and, and we're still addressing it. We have materials to help host the cleanup. We send a person, a coordinator uh, or an intern, we send them materials like uh, gloves. Um, uh, I don't know if you say a balance, but to, to measure how many pounds of, of trash you collected. Uh, we send them trash bags and we send them recycled trash bags. 
uh, from Ocean Conservancy and, and instructions on how to organize the cleanup. So cleanups are still being done regardless of the conservation theme. We're still promoting cleanups. It's still a problem, a big problem. And I will talk about that in a little, in a moment. Information tables, which are very popular with interns, especially with the education and outreach crew, because in your park, you can find materials to put on the table. And also we can send you materials for your World Migratory Bird Day education materials. So if anybody here is, is working alongside an education crew and would like to have an information table one of these days, uh, any days, like I said, any day, any day is World Migratory Bird Day. You can offer an educational activity at your park. This photo is from Chiapas, our, our coordinator from Mexico, Daniela Sosa, she sent us this photo. And this is, a, this is from 2019, Take the Plastic Pledge. We have researched that when you take a pledge and you, you know, it's Girl Scouts, uh, when you take a pledge or when you, when you say you're gonna do something, you say it out loud and, and, and you say to somebody else, you feel that you have to do it now. So this was an activity of signing a pledge that you were gonna reduce your plastic consumption after the cleanup and after this World Migratory Bird Day event. And it worked, you know, a lot of people said after cleanups in 2019, we haven't seen so much trash in this area where it used to be a problem. And, and something that 2020 also showed us was that social media campaigns and, and internet is very powerful. So. I, I took the opportunity when, when Crystal sent me this photo of, of saying, you know, I wasn't into birds, but this is an, a new love for me. And I thought, oh, because you were exposed to it. So I just took it, took her photo and, and put it on my social media saying, you know, this is the importance of education and, and hands on. We need to get youth out there and working, not just listening in a classroom. <laughs> that's my campaign uh, to get people out there and and see birds because if you see them you will know them and after you know them you will care for them that is part of this campaign so this is an ongoing campaign and you can do the same you can always always share your love for conservation in in a very nice way in a very kind and and inviting way to anybody who's listening, right? So I'll go into the problem with, with plastic before uh, talking about a sustainable lifestyle. We've seen images before of the problem with plastic. And yes, these are graphic uh, images. These are, um, I, it's very hard for me to present them and talk about them. Usually, those of us in the field of conservation and uh, especially with animals, we're very sensitive, we're very emotional and, and we really take to heart uh, that everybody should be helping out. So when we present these images, we say innocent animals, innocent species just wiped out because of our non-action or ignorance in many cases. And they're suffering. And they're suffering because of us, because of our plastic use, because of our ignoring some of the problem. It used to be that I could go to the grocery store and pick up a six pack of, of, of malt liquor that, that is for children, actually. It's not liquor, it's malt liquid. So it's just basically water and sugar, but it comes in a six pack. And, and you know, I was raised on that. So I would go to the grocery store and pick those up every time I went. And now it's been years since I've done it because they won't change the packaging, that six pack packaging that is so detrimental to the health of birds. Uh, plastic bottles. I wish you could have been in a trip with us uh, with Environment for the Americas where you can see that we don't use plastic anything. We don't use, we don't buy water in plastic bottles. If you're gonna drink water, you're gonna drink it from a reusable bottle. <laughs> and we might get you uh, a little powder substance to, for you to mix with your water for, so you can have a beverage, but we will not buy bottled water because we have total uh, control of, of not 
buying more plastic garbage. So plastic has created a worldwide epidemic. I don't have to mention that they found islands of floating plastic. It's a primary threat to birds across the globe and it's despoiled our beaches and communities. You've all seen it. It also causes bird entanglement, is ingested, and of course they die. And this one is, is not just for birds. Um, it enters the food chain through microplastics. And we have, we have research that shows, and anybody that needs this scientific research, we have it in a, in a database so we can send you the article. This one article stated that uh, uh, an adult has consumed enough microplastics through their, through their life to construct a credit card. That's, that's the amount of microplastic an average adult has in their body right now. So maybe not you in your 20s, but definitely 30 something and onwards. And plastics introduce toxins into the environment, which again, go up through the food chain and get to human beings and then causes health issues for birds and people because of the food chain. So let me reiterate how plastic impacts birds, marine life, human beings. We've grown with the growth of plastic use. I don't know about you, but like I said, I would go to the grocery store with my abuela, with my grandma, and this would be our, our, you know, our shopping cart with all the plastic bags and all the plastic containers. And it was better if it was in plastic because I was little and careless. <laughs> so she would get everything she could in a plastic container. This was before knowing about um, bifenilos, bifenilos. It was plastics were introduced in the 50s. I don't know if you remember Tupperware. I'm sure you've seen a Tupperware in your life. And those of us that still have Tupperware from, it was a family heirloom almost. But since the 50s, so many plastic has been produced. And I wish we could say, yeah, produced, recycled, reused, but no, only 9% of the plastic has been recycled in all this time. Even recycling plants have their own challenges. Here in Puerto Rico, we take our recycled products to a center and then later discovered after the Hurricane Maria, that, that is, we discovered that that center was not operational. So they were just taking all our bags of recycled, recycled products and just throwing it in, in the garbage again. So not, not really working. There was nothing else we could do about that. The centers were not working. The recycling plants were not working and they have to ship it off to another country anyways, because we don't have plastic recycling plants on the island. And like I said, the problems with companies, mega companies, yeah, there are many, but does that mean that I have to not recycle or not produce use of plastic because of that? No, what I did was, yeah, reduce the, the amount of plastic that I bought because I knew that it can be recycled. And also I still recycle, I still do my part. I, I, I feel that I have to, and that's, that's the way I, I know that most of you feel. You have to recycle and you have to do your part. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read Janelle's comment here. To add to the stats, microplastics can be found at the highest and lowest points of the globe. Yes, and if there's something that I enjoy deeply is sharing this uh, uh, peer-reviewed research on plastics and microplastics. So when uh, Molly, my colleague in EFTA was doing her research on plastics, I. I, you know, we would go into a research gate and we would go into Google academics and we would go into 
our own contacts and say, do you have research on this? And authors would just send us their research on, on plastic pollution and, and, and ways to mitigate that. So yes, let's share this, Janelle. This knowledge, great knowledge. So like I said, 79% accumulates either in landfills or natural areas. And both have problems. Landfills because this toxin going into, into the soil and into the water are polluting both resources. So landfills are a problem. If they do not end up in a landfill, they end up in a natural environment, which in my case on my island, it would be the rivers or the beaches or a forest. So how do you how do you educate people to reduce and reuse? Because the problem here is that it's accumulating. If you buy the products, they'll keep making these type of products. If we say something about, if we stop buying them, then we say something about not using them. So let's name just a couple of common plastic items that we use. I'll start with one. I, use, I used to use a lot of Ziplocs, everything in a Ziploc, uh, food in a Ziploc, <laughs> coins in a Ziploc. Um, I mean, I'd use, I'd use Ziplocs for anything. The beauty products that all come in plastic containers, it's, it's a problem. So here, we, here I am, this is not a confessional. A lot of food items come in plastic, that is true. Drinks, especially drinks. And I'll go back to this picture oh, again and again, because we are so used to being served anything in a plastic cup with a plastic lid and a plastic straw, anything. Hot or cold, yeah. yeah. Well, the hot ones come in 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 a um, carbon uh, carton carton container. But I mean, just think about it. How many times have you received your drink like this and not thought anything of it? Toys, cell phone cases, cutlery plastic bottles and those lids. Oh my gosh, this lid. Single use plastics, yeah, Devante. Many of them single use. Common, common ones that hygiene products like face wash, shampoo, toothpaste. Ah, Anna, so this is, this is my example of, of, of when I, I, I went to, I went to Susan, Susan Bonfield's our director's house and, and she's, she's very no to plastic. She's the one that it really embraced this conservation theme. And I went, you know, uh, how about toothpaste, Sue? And she says, I, I have a, a crystal container and I buy the toothpaste by the container. So she doesn't buy the tube the plastic tube of toothpaste. I said, well, that's hard for me because in Puerto Rico, I don't have that. But what do you have? So what do I have? I use whatever else I have, except the things that I can't. So uh, like you're saying, like you're saying, uh, I think it was Anna saying toothpaste, shampoo, yes. So what I'm trying to do is reduce the use of plastic, but not up my carbon footprint. I could, I could buy my shampoo, my conditioner by a bar, like in a bar, but then that would have to come from another country. And is it, is it really worth it? I think so. I think so. So we're switching. Almost, Deja says, almost everything in grocery store contains some kind of plastic wrapping or container. Oh, there are toothpaste tablets. Let me go back to Deja. Yes, almost everything has uh, whew, plastic wrapping and we understand that. 
right now we're working with a company to send you boxes of food and they wrap everything kind of separately in plastic. There, there are limits to what we can do, even economic limits, right? If, if, we, want, if we want to send you the food, we, we're gonna have to use this because eco-friendly means a lot. Shipping packages has been the worst in this pandemic. Samantha, you're so right. You're so right. It's, it's, everybody's looking to shop online and so much things come in plastic wrapping. It's, so in our office, when Chu Yu sends you the boxes or Daisy, the bell, they send you boxes, they reuse the packaging to send you some, the, the new package. So they reuse a lot of it. Let me go to two. It's all about choice. Like I said, you can choose, but to which extent? I could choose the shampoo bar, but then I'd have to up my carbon footprint because I'd have to go look for it in Amazon. But uh, what have you chosen over? And one time I was in my social, little social media campaign, I was showing off a little bamboo toothbrush and an ex-friend made fun of me. <laughs> I don't want to be friends with you anymore. You can't make fun of me and my little bamboo toothbrush. She said, you and your bamboo toothbrush. And then she sent me, and then she posted a picture of, of a company. And of course, uh, I, I didn't lash out back because I don't want people to think that you're a conservationist. You're always angry because you're angry at the world and how the world works. I'm not angry, I'm frustrated and I'm sad that you think that way, that you think that me and my little bamboo toothbrush can't save the world. Well, I just did, I feel I did. I feel not having a plastic toothbrush is one less plastic toothbrush in the landfill. And you can educate people that way. It's better than nothing, I think. It's even one toothbrush brush less is better than a plus in a plastic. So reusable coffee cups it's hard it's hard to go to the to the store and say yeah like who was saying that they would go with their hydro flask and say I would go to the cafeteria in the university and they would have to at first they started doing it just I don't know to spite me they would take the cup of the eight ounce coffee they would pour it in my in my cup and then throw away the one that they used to measure it with. And I just felt so sad. I put a little line inside my coffee mug and said, this is the eight ounces. Can you just fill it up to here? And they'd done it for a few weeks. So they started doing that. Let me see what you're, you're telling me here. They did that to me too. Oh, the bristle tips, yeah. Okay, let me go up to I buy my shampoo and conditioner bar from local and small businesses. Yeah, you have that option. I don't, and many of us don't, but yeah, we can be cooperative and send that stuff down here. Even the bamboo toothbrush has the bristles, a replaceable bristle stop. I, I've never seen it or I haven't looked for it, but yeah, they did that to me too. Yeah, they use the cups to make the drink. <laughs> yep and they throw it away. So now I'm having my piña coladas inside the pineapple. That's it. Okay, so the metal straw. Oh, I was gonna show you the metal straw, but I'll show it here. Uh, we have metal straws for sale. Okay, let me go. So those of you that are taking their lunch to the park, you know that I know an intern, I'm, I'm, I'm big. I'm big on, on being a good mom to all interns, but I have this one special intern and I told them, you have to take this, these you know, containers that are not plastic because you're gonna use them every day. You're gonna wash them every day and you're gonna take your food every day. So just wrapped up the little lunch, lunch bag and put the containers inside the bamboo cutlery. And now four, four weeks in, he goes, this was the best. Because now I'm going, I knew it, I knew it. So just invest in something that is lasts longer and is less plastic to the environment. If 
you know, I, if you want to go to, to the marketing of it all, the thrift stores, that's, that's reusing. So I have only one Salvation Army, I think, thrift store in all of Puerto Rico, or maybe two in Arecibo and San Juan. But the one in San Juan receives a lot of stuff, not the one in Arecibo. So if I go want to go to the thrift store, I have to commute an hour and a half, maybe an hour and 45 minutes, depending on traffic, which is like I said, you have to weigh in the pros and cons of, of going green, right? But thrift stores, especially for clothes, uh, the fashion industry right now, ah, it's, it's, it seems untouchable, but I hope there, the day that it's not untouchable anymore comes because it used to be that nobody talked about it, but at least now we're talking about it, talking about how the clothes, clothes industry is just messing up the water globally. So like I said, um, there are many things that we probably don't think about, like chewing gum, which is basically plastic, microbeads in our uh, hygiene, Microbeads, this was when I first heard about this one, it was, uh, you know, this was very difficult to hear because here I am in my 30s listening about how my little cream product, the, the only one that I had the luxury of buying was not great for the environment. So what do I do now? What does any scientist do? Research. What is best without the microbeads? And every time I tell this to my students, the ones that like to have, <laughs> they like bento boxes. Every time I tell my students that use these products, they say, oh, well, I live in this small town way far from the city in Puerto Rico. And my pharmacy, my local pharmacy has these. And I say they're banned because of the plastic in them. Well, you know, they still sell them. Then check for expiration date because they, they were banned in 2019, so they're not supposed to be there anymore. And you can do the same. You can check to see if, if they've, it's a product that's been expired. It's microplastics in these type of creams, especially ones that cleanse your skin, have been banned. They're not supposed to be sold. And when we buy our little munchies, and again, you see that I went back to the plastic cups just because I know that you know, somebody here is just learning that, yeah, I know, I shouldn't do that anymore. And there's maybe 10 of us going, I don't do that. I don't receive my drinks in plastic cups at all costs. I just, I just won't. And for all of you that are, you know, going into this new world of, of receiving documents, like your tax forms and stuff like that, the first thing that that comes to mind is not receiving junk mail because that's also contributing to, to the landfills and natural environment accumulations of garbage. And of course, hygiene products, reusable, reuse, reuse, reuse. Uh, you're gonna get your, you're gonna get something in these little bags, which is our reusable sandwich bag and we didn't send mosaic water bottles because it, it has been our experience that when we had gatherings, everybody had their own water bottle they had had years with the stickers and the memories of this trip and this other trip. So, so we just stopped making mosaic water bottles because everybody has one. But that's good. That's great. It's so great that we can invest our, our money in, in other stuff. So I'm running out of time here and I really want to go over what you think we should start doing more being eco-friendly with your pets including baking their own treats and now that we've used so many masks just remember to cut the strips because they entangle they also entangle in wildlife but when when we talk about oh when we talk about um wearing masks what we did was send you a reusable one, a cloth one that protects you, but it's still, still a cloth one. You don't have to. Going green means going green means doing webinars and, and using internet as a resource. And that's you guys in one of those last 
webinars. I like taking the screenshots. Where webinars are the green way of training. Another way, and this I've I've known of interns that are doing this in their parks, in their park housing, composting, because they have a facility for compost already. So they've been talking about composting, how they compost uh, in their own in their own housing complex. And so the, it was brought up two years ago. And I like to bring it up because find out if in your housing you have a way to compost. And that's a natural way of, of recycling. And this is uh, this is um, the, the way that I do it. It's not as fancy as I do it because I don't have the cages. I just have the pile one, pile two, and pile three in the backyard, way, way there in the backyard. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's possible to do composting in, in certain areas and in, even inside the apartments. So we, we have people that have compost inside apartments. And if, you if you're one of those, let us know. So now we're gonna go into the discussion and I'm gonna get my PowerPoint out of here stop sharing and please let me know what what else you know what else is is part of a sustainable lifestyle that you would like to include or maybe you would say you know I'd like to talk about sustainable lifestyles through a world migratory bird day what can I do about that so I would like to hear about you